how to choose a senior community that meets your needs today and tomorrow. This presentation was developed as a result of the hard work uh, performed by our task force that tackled this topic a little over a year ago. All of us have had stories about loved ones or friends or even people that we don't know um, coming from nursing homes primarily, but also other kinds of senior communities where there have been some concerns about whether the residents are being well cared for and whether the communities are meeting um, the needs as those residents um, decline over time, either cognitively or in terms of their ability to perform activities of daily living. And of course, where that hits us at the Care Partner Project is that all of those um, situations where people are more vulnerable, it raises tremendous concerns about um, safety and quality of care. And that's what the Care Partner Project is all about, is helping people understand how to um, recognize and choose um, care that is um, qu of quality and safety. So our task force, as I said, um, uh, uh, wrapped their arms around this project and it resulted in a page on the Care Partner Project, um, various checklists that people can download and then, of course, this community presentation. I have to give a shout out to Kathy Lovett, who is the one who really, really um, was a champion of the idea that this would be a presentation that um, our community educators um, would find broad audiences for because it hits on the concerns of so many people um, at this time where the boomer population is uh, ripe for uh considering um, the, um, all of the concerns expressed in this deck, not only for their parents, but also pretty soon for them, for us, I should say, as I'm in that boomer population and many of you are too. So as always, the second slide in the deck is your opportunity to customize uh, it with your um picture, which goes in this white box here, just plop it in a good uh, high resolution um, photo of yourself, of your friendly self. Um, obviously your name and your company name and how to contact you um, would be a great place to fill in below it. And then uh, a, a, a note on the side of recognizing and thanking your host for um, bringing you together with your audience. The third slide um, is always a nod to the Care Partner Project. And in all of our other decks, it shows a shot of our homepage. And um, in this one, we're trying something a little bit different where it's just uh, the logo. Uh, and then of course, we ask you to um, help people um, understand that they can get to the Care Partner Project simply by um, going to the URL. And there are additional references to the free checklists that are available at the Care Partner Project throughout this deck. I think we've done a little better job in this deck of helping people understand what the resources are when they go to the website, which helps supplement the information that you provide to them. I should mention that this is probably one of our longest presentations. Um, I It's a good hour, I would think, especially um, when you plan for questions and answers at the end. The next slide, as you know, is always the agenda because people like to know what's ahead. And in this case, um, the, 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 these are the strong emphasis on this plate, on this, uh, as represented in this agenda, is how to put um, your needs and priorities front and center, which means taking uh, an inventory and really doing some soul searching about um, 
what's important, not only now, but to try and anticipate for the future. How to get past the sales pitch for any of these senior um, uh, communities, because as you know, the person that picks up the phone to talk to you is somebody who is a marketing person or a salesperson. It's not somebody who is delivering actual services on a day-to-day basis. And so we, I think we do a good job of helping people to understand the kinds of questions um, that really need to be covered thoroughly. Salespeople can't always do that. And in this deck, we um, kind of uh, empower them to um, escalate their um, their conversations um, up to the different levels in the organization to really get the, the answers that they need to the um, questions and concerns that they may have. So we'll get into that later. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Um, what to watch for when you chore. Um, and the emphasis, of course, coming from the Care Partner Project is what are the cues for quality and safety and a match to your needs and priorities? So first of all, we recognize that this is a big decision. Um, you know, it's not as exciting as buying your first house. I mean, in fact, for many people, it's kind of a bittersweet decision. Um, as so many people um, will tell you, um, it's uh, it, it might be the last place they ever live. And so for that reason, there is... Um, there, there's probably the anticipation of, of good things that will happen, but it's a, it's a recognition that it's a new chapter in life. And like all big decisions that need to be made, we are um, a big proponent of putting a good process, a step-by-step -step process in place. And that's what we're going to go over here today in this deck. And the process, number one, is take stock of um, your priorities, needs, and wants. Decide on the type of community that best seems to fit your priorities. Then conduct a phone screening sort of survey questionnaire with the top prospects that you identify in the community where you want to live. And by com the larger community, the geographic community, the town or the city or the uh, rural area even where you want to live. It may be where you've lived all of your life and raised your family, or it might be someplace entirely new, like it might be someplace where the weather is better, for example. But whatever it is, um, try to, there are a lot of different options. So we really highly recommend that they um, they just do a, a simple phone screening um, to spare themselves the time um, and energy that goes into actually doing a good tour of the top prospects. You want to spend some time at each place. As, as we mentioned, it's a big decision. It's not a simple one by any means. And that last stop of touring um, really shouldn't be rushed. And maybe it will require a couple of tours, a couple of stop or even pop-ins at a place that you're considering moving to. So um, in each of these um, uh, steps here, one through four, we have a section in the presentation that covers each of these in depth. So this is just the intro. And it should be mentioned that all of these are alternatives to aging in place, that the considerations that go into that decision, aging in place versus moving elsewhere, um, I think we kind of assume that they've already been through that because this deck does not go into any of the pros and cons of aging in place. Um, and, and maybe all of you who are giving this presentation, you may have some insight to bring to bear in that in the comments or the stories that you um, tell from your own experience, but that's not where we're going with this deck. And I'm just saying that kind of parenthetically to you. Um, so going back here. So step one, take stock. What's important to you and what's not important to you? Again, um, and we launch into this thing that, um, you know, just get it all out on good old fashioned paper and pencil, or you might want to make a spreadsheet. Um, but just getting everything up on the table is really important. Chances are at this point, 
you've lived 60 or 70 years, so you have a pretty good idea of what's important to you. It's always helpful to start with good conversations with other people um, because they may think of things that you don't think of, or they, you know, your your daughter, for example, um, may have observations um, just from living with you um, that she recognizes that, um, oh, mom, you know what has always seemed to be important to you is like, you really like living near, you know, a Baskin Robbins. It seems like wherever we go, you always want to know where the Baskin Robbins is because you like that mint chip ice cream. Now that's not probably something that anybody would necessarily put on their own list, but it might be one of those, like, and this is just kind of a off the cuff example, like one of those things that just adds, um, you know, fun to life and that somebody, um, uh, you know, who is, who, who's lived with you for a long time or known you for a long time, um, would note that about you and, and see that as a, um, a, a small thing that could contribute to the quality of your life. And it could be a million different little things. But in any event, that, as I said, that's just one little example. So going over and making your list with somebody else can be really, it can be fun. It can be very productive. So again, this is sort of um, on that, you know, making your list of what's important. Here are just some topics, um, general topics that um, you may want to cover. And again, um, it, it would be super helpful probably to put all of these kinds of things on an Excel spreadsheet or some sort of, you know, maybe different sheets of paper with, um, you know, with headings with uh, each of these headings and, and more headings that um, the person will come up with. Um, and, um, and, and just, you know, throw it all against the wall or put it all on your, um, on your sheets of paper. And again, start to prioritize from there. Um, and then also here at the Care Partner Project to help this process along, we have um, checklists under lots of different headings that can also help to inform this, um, this process of, of thinking about needs, wants, and priorities. Um, this slide we put in, um, it's kind of redundant. Um, I really like the messaging on this slide um, because I have heard that um, sometimes when other family members can get involved, there might be some judgy stuff going on. Um, and so the, and I'm not saying that this is universally true at all. I'm just saying that, you know, sometimes um, uh it's just really helpful. And the main point of this is to, when you talk and you listen, um, and this would be particularly helpful if the, if your audience is people who are the adult children who are helping their parents, parents with the decision is to have open hearts and minds and help take notes. So once all of this is up, you know, you have to kind of match it with the type of community that could potentially offer the best fit. And um, we get into this section on the different kinds of, of senior communities. Now, we start with continuing care communities, also known as CCRCs, because they offer, you know, different types of communities within sort of a, a either a big building or a couple of buildings or a campus atmosphere, but they're all um, connected in one way or another. Um, and I don't mean physically connected necessarily, but they're all part of the same um, system of um, and, and owned by the same company. And I think it's important and you as advocates can speak to this um, possibly from your own experience, is that there are for profits and there are not for profits. And there are some subtle differences between the two, and we'll get into those in a little bit. But starting with continuing care communities, they typically offer independent living, memory care, assisted living, and long-term care. 
Um, or they may offer just three out of the four of those. Um, many of them do not offer either long-term care or memory care. It's, um, it's you know, they're just different um, configurations. So there's a possible substantial upfront investment and they always involve um, monthly, um, mo ongoing monthly fees as well. Um, a long-term contract may be required and um, the, the contractual aspect of this is uh, important to note because um, it's, it, you know, it, it spells out obligations. And once a contract is signed, um, it's, it is a contract. It's, it's not easy to get out of if you're unhappy for any reason, which is all the more reason to spend a lot of up upfront time really trying to figure out um, as best you can what living in any type of community or any one uh, continuing care um, community would actually feel like, look like, be like on a day-to-day -day basis. So in terms of independent living, um, you know, whether it's on its own or as part of a continuing care community, there are always typically apartments or small townhouse homes that offer a range of activities and amenities, um, sports, um, meals that you can take communally or you can order to go, or you have a, a small kitchen typically where you can make your own meals if you wish. Um, most of these in independent living will have like a meal plan. So it's a kind of a combination of meals that you can get at like at a central dining room or you can pick up and, and, and it might be something like uh, 20 meals a month or 10 meals a month, or there might be a, a, a several different plans to choose from, but um, there, there's usually, there are usually um, some provisions there and house cleaning is also offered. Um, whether it's built into your monthly fee or it's an extra fee, it is generally available. Um, transportation is usually provided. So uh, for getting around to grocery stores or doctor appointments, sometimes it's pre-scheduled and other times like for doctor appointments, you can sign up to get transportation that is um, just uh, for you. And again, that's something to look into to find out what kinds of fees um, maybe um, extra for uh, transportation or and what's included. Um, and there are community-based as well as off-campus, and I mean off-campus, meaning off-site um, social activities. So some potential unwelcome um, surprises and potential problems are um, that in continuing care communities, independent living may be significantly more attractive or buttoned up and amenity rich than their assisted memory or long-term care facilities. Check out all of them before you commit. And there is, um, um, we're going to get into this a little bit, but there's Margaret's story about her experience with a, um, with a continuing care community. Um, that is a perfect example of of buying into such a community based on how cool and wonderful and spectacular the independent living um, facilities were compared to um, the facilities for um, people as they needed more help. Because typically, People don't check out the additional facilities. They're taken in by the sizzle in the independent living side. And part of that's human nature. You know, pe people who are coming in who are busy, active, independent, um, it's really hard to think about being less busy, less active, and maybe dependent someday because of um of uh, uh, physical limitations or cognitive limitations that may crop up as you age. So all that being said, um, uh, it's, it's very um, prudent to check out all of the facilities um, 
because remember that contract, you're locked in. Um, and then for assisted living and memory care, it's really important to lock in the specifics in writing about all of the services that are included in your monthly fees, plus any ad extra costs for additional assistance um, beyond medication management. Medication management is typically included in all of these phases of in uh, senior communities and um, continuing care communities. Um, but that's about the only thing that's that's always part of it um, because that's um, it's, it's a huge, obviously, um, responsibility and safety issue. Um, but here I always give the example, um, my brother-in-law, uh, his dad was in assisted living and he was becoming a little more unsteady on his feet and a little less confident and was not going down to meals because he was worried. He just felt unsteady. It was kind of a long walk down to the dining room and he did have a walker, but he just wasn't as con as confident. And so Jeff, my brother-in-law, asked them, and I said, he said, would you mind just walking my dad from his room down to the dining room meals? Because he really enjoys the company. He's a, an outgoing guy and um, he's just, you know, it just does him good to get out rather than take his meals in his room. So at the end of the month, Jeff got a bill for taking his dad back and forth to the dining room three times a day. So that's six trips at a um, hundred dollars round trip because it was $50 each way. So that was $300 a day for a month, which added up to, if my math is correct, around $9,000 that month, just because Jeff in his offhanded way said, dad's worried about falling. Um, could you, could you, you know, kind of walk him down to the dining room? That was a very interesting and unexpected development. So it's just things like that. Um, it's just very important to understand um, what's included and what's not. And and if you ever have any questions, um, you know, just uh, or any, just just always ask. Um, also, another thing that could be a very unwelcome surprise if there are any planned construction or renovations, either in the community itself or the area around it. Um, uh, people can be very sensitive to noise. And if you are one of those people, this could be very upsetting. Um, people who are suffering from um, dementia have are acutely affected by noise typically. And so this would be something that if somebody's in memory care and there's going to be a lot of construction, that would be one to cross off your list because um, that is actually very, very, very upsetting to many people who are um, suffering from dementia. So that's just, those are just two small examples. So in this case, um, I'm, there's in your toolkit um, is um, uh, Margaret's story. And this is talks about her signing up to live in um, the, the, the Ritz. It wasn't literally the Ritz Carlton brand, but it was the Ritz of independent living, um, which she, when it came time for assisted living, um, it was and moving into the assisted living um, uh, quarters uh, compared to her independent living was the frumpy motel. I, I said frumpy motel six before, but I thought I have to be really careful about using brand names. So everybody gets the difference between like a ritzy hotel and, and, a, and a motel. And that's exactly what happened um, with with Margaret and it was awful. But in Margaret's story too, the the one of the main lessons of that is that not only were the accommodations really, 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 really disappointing, it was the medication errors that were made that were just downright scary. 
So it, I guess you could say it might be a clue that if somebody isn't providing the care and the respect and the detail that went into independent living and using that care and respect and detail to put it into managing assisted living, that there could be some big safety issues involved. And in Margaret's case, there clearly were. So with assisted living, what you can expect there is help with daily living, um, compact apartments with small kitchens and small appliances, but no ovens or dishwashers. Um, so it would be like a microwave and maybe a coffee maker. Um, meals are generally served in the dining rooms, but if somebody doesn't feel up to going to the dining room, meals typically will be brought into um, the residence rooms. Um, and um, and there are, you know, there's there's more available in terms of, um, you know, bathing, showering, washing hair, personal care, um, and even um, help with um, meals. And again, it's very important to find out too which of these will be um, additional costs and which will are just simply included. Also, it's important to find out if the assisted living has tiered levels of services and and pricing that goes along with it. So it would be um, levels one through four typically. So a level one is basically very minimal assisted living, maybe just with medications, whereas four would be, you know, help with um, bathing, dressing, eating, et cetera. So um, in the dining room, there will be um, typically um, uh, people get to choose what they want to eat. And typically um, they ask for residents to fill out their menus for a week or several days in advance. And um, this is another thing. Some people with us in assisted living can't really organize their thinking around making choices for several days at a time. So this is another good question to ask. Um, do ask of yourself when you're thinking about going into senior community, would I feel comfortable filling out a menu for a week in advance or would I want somebody to help me? And if I do need somebody to help me, will there be a charge for that? So it's really, it's it's kind of daunting, isn't it? I mean, there are so many little details, but it's really important to cover them. Housekeeping and laundry services are always included. Sometimes um, residents are encouraged to do their own laundry for as long as they want to or they can. Um, laundry services, again, it could be a la carte or not. Um, medications are always administered by staff. And then of course, um, uh, other um activities of daily living um, need to be covered as well. So memory care communities is a, a, um, help for body and mind. And memory care is geared for those diagnosed with dementia and they have small studio type apartments usually. Um, it's very simple um, and they're all designed to create a safe environment um, for those who are living with impaired daily living skills, including locked doors. Um, there are, um, all, and, and oftentimes the memory units are sort of tucked away apart from other units. Um, again, just to make sure that there's no, um, that people aren't, you know, coming to the doors of the memory unit very often from other parts of the um, campus or facilities, um, because every time a door is opened, it's a real um, it's a real risk that people will want to leave. Um, it's it's just something that does happen. The sort of the wandering um, is sort of a feature of those who are dealing with um, cognitive decline. Um, there are communal meals only, and staff will help as needed with um, showering, uh, toileting, dressing. Expect costs to be higher 
um, and it's not covered by Medicare or Medicaid um, or any of those Medicare Advantage plans. <laughs> um, so I don't know if they promise them or not. I'm just being a little bit cynical here, I guess. Um, but in any event, um, these um, these are, uh, and, and so often I, I hear stories of people who are um, wanting their parents or wanting to live in its assisted living for as long as possible because of the jump that happens um, when somebody um, really needs to be in a safer environment in memory care. It's a tough decision. And also, I think it's really important to understand and look in the contract, um, who makes that decision? Does the family or the person make the decision that it's time to go from independent to assisted, for example, or assisted into memory care? Um, or does the community have the right to make the decision? Um, oftentimes it's the community, the administration of the company that makes the decision for when those transitions need to happen. So here's another story that you can read. It's about Carol, who was in memory care, who um, longed to see her mother and repeatedly fell while trying to reach the door to get outside. She was sure that her mom was waiting for her in the family car in the parking lot. And she spent so many long days just walking the halls, searching, searching, searching for a way to get to her mother. And it was really heartbreaking. So I'll leave that story for you to read. It's in your, um, it's in your speaker kit. So long-term care is usually um, where one would go after surgery or care during a serious long illness. And typically um, this would be based on a doctor's orders. And it's um, and it can be covered by um, Medicare or Medicaid, and it may or may not be covered by Medicare Advantage. So this is a good thing to check, especially the Medicare Advantage programs, which have um, more parameters around them than the Medicare um, programs. I'm not sure about Medicaid, but this is for when people really need uh, physical therapy. They need uh, possibly um, feeding tube or um, or urinary um, catheter care. Um, and this is also a time when um, palliative or hospice care um, may be needed as well. So um, if people can go into long-term care and get well enough to go back into other areas um, in their uh, continuing care communities, or or even sometimes, um, you know, if they're admitted to long term care from the hospital, and they and before that they had all lived independently, they could certainly recover um, uh, well enough to go back to their former life. But it's generally thought that this is you know long term care is it. I don't know how long term is defined, but. It's, it's usually at least for a week or two or three or, or more. It varies. So the next step is to, after you understand and you pick out, okay, this seems to be the kind of um, community that I would best fit for me, is that we recommend that people go to step three and is to call all the top prospects and quiz them. So first of all, though, um, uh, it's, it's very helpful to check the online reviews, to ask around and to ask a nurse, if you can find a nurse who either works at a hospital and sees lots of people who are admitted from an assisted living, for example, or a long, or a, um, an independent living or, or memory care. They see everything and they all know you know, um, where the the great care is happening and the not so great care is happening. So, and also Yelp is a good place to look for um, Yelp reviews. And, um, and we, I mean, of course, you know, the caveat is that people who write Yelp reviews tend to be more on the disgruntled side. Um, but, um, 
you um, you can also um, see, start to see some patterns. Um, so again, take it with a grain of salt, but but look for a lot of different sources of input. And that's what I'm saying. Ask nurses, ask your friends, go out on Facebook and say, hey, we're thinking about these communities, private message me if you have any insights or info about any of them, good, bad, or otherwise. Um, use your use your networks to really um, dig into the reputations. Um, and um, you'll, you definitely, and also another good thing to look at is you can go on Indeed, which is a site for employees and where the employees rate their employers. So you can look up any of the um, um, the communities that you're thinking about considering and find out what their employees have been saying about them. The only thing with Indeed is that you have to set up an account. It's a free account. So you know you're going to get, once you sign up, you know, you'll start getting a lot of emails from Indeed, but it might be worth it. Because um, employees um, ratings uh, can really tell you a lot about um, the the vibe of the community and how it's how it's managed. So that's a good resource as well. So then, when you let your fingers do the walking and phone the the top prospects, pick two, three, or four. Um, you can follow your checklist. Um, from the Care Partner Project that have lots of good questions to ask. Remember that the people that you're talking to on the phone, they are selling. So sometimes you have to keep pressing for answers. And sometimes you have to keep, they say, well, we don't know, or, you know, why don't you just come in and we'll talk about it. You know, you're totally entitled to say, well, please let me know um, of somebody else in the organization who will be able to answer these questions. I don't have a ton of time and I'm going to do, I would just be very forthright and say, I'm doing all my screening on the phone and I have some things that are very, very important to me and I need answers. So, you know, they're nice people usually. So they'll, I bet you, you know, they'll, they'll help you. Oh, uh, they'll do their best. And if they don't, then isn't that a red flag? So here on the next couple of slides um, are, are things, topics to cover in your phone interview, the key questions to ask. And I won't go through all of these with you, except one of the things I think is very telling is to find out um, if they all have medical doctors that they're affiliated with, but you want to find out if any of them have geriatric training or if they're geriatricians. Um, this issue of um, staff to Oh, I should change this word, not patient ratio. It's staff to resident ratio. Um, is that that's going to, there's no hard and fast rule about that. For example, you might call one and they say, oh, our staff to resident ratio is 19 to one. And you think, oh, okay, that, they're all adults. That sounds great. And then you'll call another one and they'll say, oh, ours is like seven to one and a third one will say nine to one. And then you'll kind of get the idea of like, hmm, that one that's 19 to one, they're really the outlier. Um, they're, that doesn't feel as good as the, um, as the lower um, ratio. Um, again, um, it's, it, you know, so this is really kind of all relative and whether the um, doctors have um, geriatric training or geriatrician specialist, again, that's all relative. Um, but you would really do want to dig into the, the backgrounds and also find out um, what hospitals they're affiliated with. Where is the closest hospital? What is the emergency room that would be used? So you want to check out, you know, the ratings of those local hospitals as well. Um, and the frequency of rounding on the units, um, you know, are how often do the doctors check in? How often are they there? It's not going to be daily. It will be something else I, and it will be different for every every um, community. And then ongoing professional staff training and ask us particularly, even for assisted living, is what have what kind of training have they had with TIPA Snow training? Um, TIPA Snow is the go-to for any training on 
how to understand cognitive de decline and what that means for the individual and how best to help that person who is suffering cognitive de decline. And if they haven't had any TEPA snow training, to me anyway, that is a red flag. Um, the ideal is that they've had it and they have it regular and that they have regular refreshers every quarter, every six months or something else. But again, this is all relative. So again, so here are just some other things in the checklist. So here are the red flags, um, possible signs of poor quality, um, risky care and other concerns. Um, these are not necessarily deal breakers, but these are good details to sweat. So, I mean, as advocates, you can go over all of these um, and, um, and you probably have a lot to um, offer yourself here and probably have some uh, anecdotes to share, um, especially like um, you may have some horror stories and it's okay to tell them because people, um, as you can tell, um, uh, there it, it's, you know, when you talk to, anybody who's working for a, um, a, a senior community. And even when you're tour, um, it, it's still all very superficial compared to what the experience is like when you're actually living there. So as much as possible, you want to ferret out all potential um, details that you possibly can before you make a contractual commitment where you put down usually a lot of money or you make a commitment to pay a lot of money in the monthly uh, fees. So then the next step is step four, time to tour. And this is where you tour with your senses. Um, look for, listen for, sniff for, and taste. Food is very important to people. Um, again, um, the, the red flags to look for when you're touring are a whole list of these, and then maybe you might have more to add. Again, and they can you can pick up um, a lot of these things at the Care Partner Project. We we do have a checklist for for these kinds of things. Um, there are special considerations for couples. Um, an interview will be necessary. Medical records are reviewed. Um, I thought this was very interesting. This was a new one for me, um, that hybrid apartments may be available. Um, one person in the couple may receive medication management or support and other kinds of help um, that the other person um, doesn't necessarily need quite yet. And quite honestly, these um, when, and these are horror stories that I have heard, when the hybrid apartments are not available and the couples are living together, the person who is more capable is usually then becomes responsible for helping the person who, you know, their spouse who is having some significant challenges. And that can really erode the well being of the person who is um, still in um, very good health. So this, these are, um, these are pretty um, interesting and um, hopefully um, viable solutions for couples who really want to be together, but may be at different points in their lives. Um, so there, they will always screen you for the financial um uh, viability of your being able to live in any of these communities. Um, I think the important thing here is that they need to be prepared. Finances feel deeply personal, but when it comes to this decision, there's nothing, you, you can't hide anything. It, it's got, it's, and you have to be able to talk about everything. Um, and likewise, um, ask for a lot, lots, lots of questions. Um, about uh, you know what future costs will be. Sometimes faith-based communities, um, these are the nonprofits, uh, may offer financial assistance, and it's definitely worth asking about that. Uh, I should mention to you, like there's one here in the Chicago area, Presbyterian Homes, um, that is really 
fancy and pretty and very high end, but it's faith-based and they do offer financial assistance, but that's not something that comes up in the conversation. That's something you have to ask about. They don't offer it. So um, it's definitely worthwhile to, to bring it up. Um, again, get navigating the cost and contracts. A huge thing here is to really um, review everything with a lawyer, accountant, financial planner, possibly another family member or trusted friend. Um, the more eyes that can go into reviewing this contract, the more peace of mind you'll probably have. Um, so now you've made a decision. Now what? Okay, you're moving in. You're going to have a move-in date. There are lots of logistics. Um, there's a lot that goes into the plan. Um, sometimes advocates are really great resources for helping people um, find um, resources to um, help people give away that china that none of the kids wants and that silver. And... <laughs> and pack up those boxes of things and decide, do they go into storage or do, they, do we donate all of these hundreds of books that have been on our bookshelves for years? All of those decisions, big and small, there are services um, for that. And I think advocates have um, their fingers on the pulse of a lot of these services. And sometimes the community that you're moving into will actually offer these services for an additional fee or yeah, I think it's always an additional fee. Um, so you've moved in. Now what happens? The main thing you do, it's your last quality and safety check, and is that is to get involved. And if anything does not match up with what you were promised, act quickly. Ask for a meeting, include your people, your peeps, the people who helped you with this decision, any of your advisors, um, to be part of that meeting. And and then use your um, care partner project checklist and the notes that you kept during while you were doing your due diligence and get, use these notes to back up or help explain any concerns or, or any disappointments that you're experiencing, anything that just isn't lining up. Um, have a good conversation. This is your home and this is what you expected. And if you're not getting it, you know, expect accountability, ask for fixes, um, ask about the details of when those fixes will happen and the timing. And then finally, get it in writing. Okay, so this is a lot. Are you feeling overwhelmed? There is help. And um, the reliable, there are reliable, independent professionals who can be at your side guiding you through this process. Um, certified senior advisors, and you can find them listed uh, at the Society of C Certified Senior Advisors and professional patient advocates. Um, and what we mean, and you can explain this better than anybody, that independent means they're not paid by any senior com uh, community. They're not paid a referral or a finder's fee. There are lots of companies out there, there that advertise on TV. Um, and just be aware that they are paid a referral and a finder's fee. So um, they're, they're, their first allegiance is to their those organizations that are paying them. So two that are not are our senior care authority and care patrol. Um, these, uh, by the way, from the Care Partner Project and from you, are examples of independent professionals, not endorsements. So search in your area, we recommend that the people search in their area for these and similar consultants, but always ask, you know, you know, basically, what is your business model? And then you find out um, whether they are paid by the, um, the uh, senior communities or not. So then this is the last slide or next to the last slide and you open up the floor for ideas and questions and a good check and I'm sure you'll get it. The last slide is always a thank you um, where you insert your picture again with all of your name, your name and your cred credentials and how people can um, contact you. And then if this presentation was helpful to you, 
um, ask them to spread the word about it with groups in um, your area and then let them know that you speak on other topics in person or on Zoom and just to drop you a note. So this is 41 slides and a lot. Um, please let people know that um, they'll get an email from you with all of the notes in um, the handout. So it will um, come their way. You can send them a thank you note and um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy giving this presentation as much as we enjoyed putting it together. Thank you.